Welcome everybody to this uh, edition of the whole business wellness webinar on flourishing with bipolar and borderline personality disorder. Whole Business Wellness is a training and consulting company and we help companies to build the capabilities uh, that support a culture where people can thrive and not just survive. Uh, mainly focused around mental health and psychological safety and bringing more mindfulness into the workplace. So the session tonight, uh, we will run as a uh, panel discussion for about 30 minutes. Uh, at the end of that 30 minutes, we will stop the recording and then we will have an open mic and it will just be a general discussion, very informal. You can ask the panel members anything you like um, <laughs> within reason during that session uh, and we can run for an hour or if people still have questions, uh, we can probably run a little bit longer. So uh, without further ado, let me just welcome our two guests. So I'm just gonna spotlight Benita and, uh, it's not just disappeared off my screen somewhere. So let me just find Benita again. <laughs> Here she is, here's Benita. Okay, so that you can see both of them and myself as well. So if you put your view to speak of you, you should just be able to see the three of us. Um, so I'm multitasking here and letting people uh, in as they join the as they join the call. So we're very lucky to have with us tonight uh, Bernita Chick, who's based here in Hong Kong, where I am also based, and Solène Angre, who is based in the UK, uh, despite her French sounding name. Um, so, um, so Solène will introduce herself in a moment. Solène hosts the talk show, uh, The Inclusion Conversation. She's authored four books, including Where To Next. She's a DNI practitioner, a mental health advocate, and she flourishes with borderline personality disorder. So welcome Solène and a special congratulations, Solène. We just got married <laughs> in the last week or so, uh, which is really lovely. And then Benita Chick. Uh, with me here in Hong Kong, Benita is the founder and CEO of Encompass HK. She's a social entrepreneur, uh, an SDG advocate. Uh, she's also an advocate for LGBTQIA, uh, as well as a mental health ambassador. So we're very fortunate to have the two of them here with us this evening. Uh, and we're just going to explore what is bipolar, what is borderline personality disorder, how does that show up for the for the two guests we have on the show um how was it what was the diagnosis process like how do they manage to survive and thrive and flourish and do all the amazing things that they do while they have these um conditions which for many people seem very daunting very almost disabling um in the in the general perception so we're going to unpack all of that find out what that is really all about uh, hopefully we will all learn together uh, and said so at the end, we'll have plenty of time for questions. So at that point, over to you, Benita Solen. Uh, please feel free to introduce yourselves briefly and then we'll you know, get to the questions. Uh, I'll go first. So uh, yeah, I'm Benita, um, uh, based in Hong Kong. So uh, I do a lot of uh, sustainable development goal program uh, uh, with my LGBT background. <clears throat> I also uh, advocate for different minority group, uh, whether it's differently abled or migrant domestic worker. Uh, I've been diagnosed with uh, bipolar when I was 24 uh, and I publicly um, come out about my disorder about two years ago and that's uh, with the help of Brian and uh, now I'm a little bit more talking about my mental health um, but uh, in my previous life I was a power bank instructor I help people uh, 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 develop their resilience in outdoor which I think is very good for mental health so uh, yeah over to you Solene. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so happy to be here. Um, so I'm Solène. I was born and raised in France. Um, I always loved traveling. So I've lived in six different countries and traveled to more than 50 uh, now. So um, that's really my passion. And I spend a lot of time working in the, in the travel industry. Like Brian said, I also have um, my own uh, venture. So I have a business called Be Beyond Borders. Um, I'm an author of four books, uh, including where to next, which is a travel memoir. 
Um, and I started a year ago the Inclusion Conversation, which is a talk show that aims to break down borders and bring people closer together one conversation at a time. And so I was diagnosed with um, borderline uh, just over a year ago in April um, 2021. And we'll come to that in a bit more detail later, I think. Um, and we recently did an episode of the Inclusion Conversation about uh, borderline. So I think that's when I really started talking about it. Um, and it's still, I think, quite terrifying to do that. So please bear with me, but hopefully we'll bring to you a lot of value and a lot of answers today. Um, and maybe just to round it up, uh, I also work for Innovate UK as a program lead for disabled innovators. So helping people with a wide range of disabilities to uh, fund their business and grow their business um, as well. So that's a bit about me. Um, back to you, Brian. Amazing, amazing. Thank you both so much. Uh, so I think you'll agree it's uh, it's very impressive what these uh, what these two individuals uh, are doing every day. Uh, and achieving every day. Uh, very, very special people. And uh, I take a huge amount of inspiration for both of them. Uh, but as you heard, both of them uh, have a sense of um, discomfort, I would say, probably it's not too strong a way of putting it, um, around disclosing their mental health condition. Uh, and I think we'll find that is due to all of these misperceptions that people have uh, and the stigma um, that still attaches to these conditions. Uh, so that's what this event is all about tonight is just to really unpick what is this that we're really talking about um, and why is that stigma still there and maybe if we get to it what if anything we can do about it um, but I think we're making a good start just by hearing the real experience hearing the stories and just learning and understanding some more so Benita you mentioned you published your um, you know your bipolar condition just over maybe about a year ago maybe 18 months something like that um and that was for me really interesting because obviously you have your uh, lesbian flag behind you and your lgbt flag <laughs> and you've been comfortable about that and you've been out very publicly since i think you were a teenager uh, about your sexuality um so maybe tell us a bit more about your bipolar uh, what, what is that how does that affect you how does that show up and, and why was it that you were so reticent to tell people about it so um I was diagnosed when I was 24 with bipolar, but it didn't start off with that. I uh, I was actually doing my PhD and I was uh, not functioning. I was I was sleeping a lot. I had difficulty concentrating. I was crying. Uh, I was very nervous about my qualifying exam and I kind of had a breakdown. Uh, and my family uh, bring me back to Hong Kong to see all sorts of psychiatrists, psychologists. So I went for like months of that, uh, seeing private uh, psychiatrists. Uh, and then at one point I was I was too depressed to a point that I was suicidal uh, and uh, it was, I was also uh, hurting myself. I was doing self-harm uh, and I, at one point I was uh, hitting my mom, which is very unusual because I love my mom. And my family finally decided that that's, they cannot um, they cannot control uh, my my uh, my symptom anymore. So I was admitted to the hospital. Uh, and to me, that, that was the best thing uh, that, that happened because uh, I was seeing a lot of private psychiatrists uh, uh, before the hospital uh, admission. And they tell me all sorts of things. They tell me panic, uh, panic uh, disorder, they tell me anxiety, they tell me depression, but nobody told me it's bipolar. But uh, two days after I was um, admitted to the hospital, the doctor said uh, they observed me, they observed my symptom and they think it's bipolar. So after I got the medication, I was uh, I was a lot better. I was a lot more stable. Uh, and uh, since then, uh, uh, it has been about 15, 16 years since I'm diagnosed. Uh, there have been relapses, uh, mostly due to my relationship. Uh, when I'm breaking up with my girlfriend, I get very sick and uh, I will get into this uh, depresso, depressive mood uh, where I will, I, I have uh, I, 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 I sleep very long time. I lost interest in everything. I feel very sad. Uh, but sometime uh, when uh, I was last time, actually I, I was admitted to a hospital earlier this year as well. Uh, that was the opposite side. I, I wasn't admitted for my depression. I was admit, admit, admitted for my uh, manic episode. So the bipolar individual fluctuate from uh, depression uh, to manic. And if, when, when, when the manic is so se severe, we call it psychosis. Uh, when it's less severe, we call it uh, hypomonia. So 
what happened when I'm manic is I, I talk very fast. Uh, I don't need to sleep a lot. Uh, I, I, I actually, uh, I was so, I was so on a high. I was using my credit card and I just put myself into four season. I was buying all sorts of things. Uh, my thoughts are racing. Uh, and mostly that I think the episode is uh, I was in the beginning of my uh, new relationship and I was uh, having a lot of fun with my new girlfriend and uh, I was not very compliant with my drug uh, because we were drinking a lot and uh, that was that is not a really highly recommend don't skip your drug it's really bad uh, so I, I I think I, I just I have been skipping drugs for too long and I just went for this manic high and I can't control it so I was in the hospital for another uh, another two weeks earlier this year and uh, to be honest, I think it, it does affect my work. Uh, so uh, it was early this year and, and luckily it was around Chinese New Year. So there was not a lot of business, but I did need to cancel maybe two or three workshops because I'm just physically in the hospital. I cannot perform. Uh, but I, I think uh, I've learned to uh, manage it uh, better. So uh, I've uh, uh, ordered some self-help book uh, or maybe or some uh, mood chart to help charting my uh, moods. Uh, so I, I'm hoping that with, with drug compliance and, and, and tracking my behavior that I will be a better patient. Uh, or not just a patient, but uh, we call it, uh, I'm not suffering from bipolar, but I'm living with bipolar. I'm embracing that mood swing as, as, as part of me. So uh, yeah, that's my story. Yeah. Yeah, amazing. I mean, that, that must be, you know, incredibly challenging when you have those really manic periods. Like you said, you feel on top of the world and you feel like you can do anything and sometimes your judgment becomes impaired and you do things that are maybe a little reckless or, or dangerous or just melting your credit card in that example. Uh, and then sometimes you get the, the, the big down as well. So uh, kind of quite a roller coaster to, to have to manage and navigate. Uh, but well noted on the uh, the compliance with the treatment. There's all sorts again of confusing messages about uh, drugs insofar as mental health is concerned. But um, not taking the drugs is probably not very smart <laughs> in most cases. Uh, but I think uh, so. Then coming to you um, in terms of borderline personality disorder, I'm not sure there are much in the way of drugs. But let's hear from you your story. What, what is borderline, and how does that show up for you? And, and what was your diagnosis, and, and what was the the progress from there. Absolutely. Um, first of all, thank you so much, Benita, for sharing about uh, your story. Uh, my auntie, my uh, dad's sister, um, had bipolar. So um, it's, I think, you know, really brave to um, share openly. And I wish that, you know, in her lifetime, she would have heard more people and seen more people like you living and thriving. Uh, with uh, with the diagnosis, because I think that would have made a really big difference. So um, just want to say that. Um, borderline. So yeah, not many people know about um, borderline. So borderline um, personality disorder is the full name. BPD is the acronym. Um, I prefer to call it borderline because I think when you put personality disorder at the end of it, it makes it sound horrible, <laughs> uh, for lack of a better word. Um, there's also an alternative name that has been given sometimes. So you might hear of EUPD, which is um, emotionally um, emotional and stable uh, personality disorder, which again, I think is even worse. So I don't use it. But if you hear about it, it's actually the same, um, the same thing. So borderline um, is a, is been shown to be a, there's a genetic predisposition which means that in your gene, you might have some elements of um, imbalance or differences that make you prone to develop borderline. And then it's that combined with um, uh, an invalidating environment, which can take many different forms. It could be um, abuse. A lot of the time it's linked to abuse, but sometimes it's not. It could be bullying. It could be just simply being invalidated um, growing up, you know, by, by your family, your friends, or other forms of, of trauma. Um, it's mostly commonly diagnosed in adolescents, um, but we'll hear later for me, it was much later in life. Um, and I just wrote down and I'll just read you through because I think it's easier to understand. So very quickly, there are nine traits for BPD. So fear of abandonment, unstable relationships, unclear or shifting self-image, impulsive, destructive behavior, self-harm, extreme emotional swings, chronic feeling of the emptiness, explosive anger, 
and feeling suspicious or out of touch with, with reality, which might go all the way to um, dissociation, um, for example, and extreme paranoia, for example. So that's the nine traits. And to be diagnosed with um, borderline, you need to meet a minimum five traits and it needs to be over a long period of time and also to affect lots of different aspects of your life. So a lot of people may be sitting, listening and like, yeah, I'm kind of like that. You know, I don't like when people leave or something like that. You know, that's not enough. And actually, if you say that to someone who has borderline, they're probably not going to take it very well. Oh, I think that was a bit of an echo there. I think it's gone. Um, so, so you need to meet a minimum five traits. But as you can see, that means so many different combinations, right? 256 possible different combinations to get to the borderline diagnosis. And it means that two people who have the same diagnosis of borderline may only have one of the traits in common. So there's lots of variation and it's called a heterogeneous disorder. It means lots of different types of experiences, lots of different types of symptoms that can come out of it. And this might seem a little bit long. Why is she still talking about this? Because I think it's really important because I sit here and I'm going to give you one personal experience, one version of the symptoms. And I just want to make sure that everyone is aware that I'm talking from personal experience. I'm not talking, you know, as an expert or a psychologist or um, a psychiatrist that is, uh, you know, going to give you like all the theory and all of the research behind it. So, um, so I thought that was important, important to know and to give justice to the diversity of the community that I represent uh, here today. Um, and so for me personally, I'll just focus on, you know, three main, um, I suppose, challenges very briefly. One is what I touched on, the emotional instability. Uh, Benita described for bipolar, it can be, you know, like a manic phase and, and then the depressive phase. For borderline, it's seconds, minutes of shifts. Um, and that's what professionals um, use a lot to differentiate. Because uh, sometimes it's hard to know, does someone have bipolar? Do they have borderline? And the main difference is in that kind of time. Um, so for me, I can go from being super happy. Oh, it's my wedding. I'm so happy. One minute to like something happens. Someone breaks something. Why did you break this? What happened? Like really angry. So it's very quick, intense emotional shifts. And that can be really hard personally of course that sometimes you don't even understand like why am I angry right now what's happening or why am I sad what's going on what happened I was happy um and it can of course be even more difficult for your loved ones around you you know the <laughs> what is going on here you know um so that's that's a big challenge I think the second one I would point out is that um fear of abandonment uh, I'm terrified of abandonment both in the sense of like someone just like my partner going away for the weekend I'm fine once I'm alone but the fact of him leaving is like oh, is he gonna come back is he gonna come back what is he gonna do what's gonna happen oh my god oh my god all of that and even more so in the fear of losing someone obviously you know having to grieve someone close to you like I can't even bear the thought and that leads to a lot of nightmares and a lot of challenges around the idea of losing like my parents, my partner, my sister, you know, people really close to me. And then the third thing would be those unhealthy coping behaviors. So I think pre-therapy, I always thought, you know, oh, there's something wrong with me because, you know, binge eating, suicidal thoughts, panic attacks that lead to like hitting walls, hitting objects, things like that, hitting myself. I always hurt myself. I've never turned against anyone, touch wood so far. Um, it's very self-directed for me. Um, but yes, I used to think obviously it's a big problem. And then through therapy, I realized actually every single behavior has a purpose. And this is the way that we have learned to cope with the emotions, with the fear of abandonment, with the un uncapturable sense of self, moving, constantly moving sense of self, all of these things, they're so intense that these coping strategies are actually helpful, which sounds completely counterintuitive. They're helpful, but they're unhealthy. And it's about through therapy and through realizing and the diagnosis and all of these steps, realizing that they are helpful strategies that are healthy. 
and that's much better <laughs> and shifting from one to the other um, but everything we do has actually a purpose and helps us in some way um, so that's I thought was really interesting so I wanted to share with you and then I'll end on other things because borderline of course is all of these things that I've said and there are days that it's extremely extremely hard I'm not gonna pretend I just also want to give that more nuanced view borderline is also huge amounts of creativity it's also um, empathy tons of empathy for others um, it comes with huge sensitivity to the world and to the suffering in the world and so that willingness to help people to do something I need to do something I always need to do something I'm like we have to change we have to help um, and it comes finally with I think an ability to strangely be really calm in very intense panic crisis kind of situations um, I remember a case of I was at a restaurant and a gas um, uh, it's like a barbecue gas I can't remember what it's called anyway it like blew up and the chef caught fire and I was the first person to be on my feet and throwing water on the chef you know there was no like cover to put on him so I was just like throwing water and most people were just completely frozen so I think in that crisis moment because our pain levels of pain go faster up stay up longer and takes longer to go down and that's been proven through fmri studies um, which is imagery of the brain so i think there are you know these kind of great strengths as well that come with being different and i see having borderline uh, or having bipolar as being different um, and so i wanted to share this with you today so back to you brian yeah, thanks so much for sharing all of that, Zelen. That was uh, a lot of information and some of it kind of daunting and a little bit scary. Frankly, some of those <laughs> symptoms that you mentioned, they all sounded pretty tough, never mind five or six or nine of them. So, you know, really amazing. Um, but one thing I, I would like to hear a little more is the like the treatment regime. How do you how do you actually manage that? What sort of help did you get? Because I, th I think I'm right that the, the medication is not really, there's not, not really a medication that will fix borderline. So what, what is the way of, of trying to manage it more effectively? Yes, you're right. So there isn't really like a dedicated um, medical treatment um, that has been, you know, used across the board. Some people with a borderline diagnosis will be on medication because often what happens with borderline is that it comes or it can come with other um, diagnosis. So you might have bipolar and borderline, actually. You might have anxiety and borderline or depression and borderline and therefore might be taking medication linked to what's called, it's called comorbidities when two um, or more um, diagnosis or, or conditions come together. Um, but otherwise, there isn't really that dedicated medication. And so I'm not on any medication currently. Um, I haven't tried any. And it was also, it, you know, because there is not one dedicated treatment, it also then comes down a lot to personal choice. And so for me personally, I really wanted to, I was like, I'll try everything else before um, taking medication if I can uh, afford, you know, not to um, in that sense. So, um, so the treatment of choice, let's say, is, um, is therapy. Uh, and the main therapy that is used uh, for borderline personality disorder is uh, called, it's another acronym, it's called DBT, uh, which stands for Dialectic Behavioral Therapy. Um, it's quite similar to maybe, you know, CBT, um, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. The main difference is um, CBT focuses very much on thoughts and behavior, and DBT adds uh, body sensation and emotions. Um, to um, to the, the approach. It was developed by um, a psych psychologist or psychiatrist, so we have to check, um, uh, called Marsha Linehan. She's amazing. Um, if you're interested in this topic, by the way, like she's written several different books, um, so do, do check, check it out. Um, so Marsha Linehan developed uh, DBT because she herself had borderline personality disorder. She tried everything. She tried psychoanalysis. She tried CBT. She tried so many therapies and it wasn't working. And she went um, actually um, to uh, India and, uh, and, and China and to Asia and she traveled and she stayed in a monastery with monks, monks and she learned and so, she much learned about... so much about... Oh. Oh. Sorry, there was a bit of an echo. 
is that is that better cool um so yeah very briefly on her story so she learned a lot about um eastern uh philosophy and different approaches and so she wanted to bring that into uh into the the therapy and so that's how she developed dialectic behavioral therapy so there's a lot of mindfulness for example within dbt um and so i i did that i did a, a full cycle of dialectic behavioral therapy which takes about a year and you go through four modules you do mindfulness um emotion regulation um, distrust tolerance and interpersonal relationships because relationships can be really really hard uh, when you have borderline personality disorder um, but yeah so that gives you um, a lot of skills it's so different like I tried psychoanalysis which is a lot about you know the Freudian version of therapy you lie on the sofa and tell lots of things um, you talk about your past and all of that DBT is completely different. It's all about equipping you with healthy coping strategies that you can turn to in times of difficulty. And so it's relearning. It's learning different, uh, differently. Um, and so each uh, week you learn about a different, it's called skill, a different skill that you can use in different situations or when something happens or when you're interacting with people. You know, it's, it's amazing. So it's more almost like a class in a way. And that's in group. So I did group uh, therapy and that's amazing because you also get the mirror effect of when someone says something that you think and you're like, no, no, you can't, no, this is terrible. Why do you think you're a piece of shit? And then you look at yourself and you're like, oh, I tell myself every day that I'm a piece of shit. So it just like gives you that mirror effect where you, it, it makes, it helps with the penny drop kind of, huh, how, and, and, in, and exploring that. And then you can have also individual therapy where well, you will go a bit more detail about mainly about focusing on the present and the future. How can you use this skill in the situation to help you to do something different? Um, so it's much less focused on the past, much more focused on the present and the future. And it's much more about equipping you with tangible, practical skills. And the whole entire time I was thinking, why don't we teach this to kids? At school. I was going to say, um, it sounds so, like yeah. we could all benefit from that. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, I'll, I'll end on that. But yeah, that, I think amazing. we could all really uh, go explore DBT. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's lovely. I mean, I'm, I'm great to hear. It's great to hear about uh, DBT. I think more people should be aware of that. Um, but really interesting to know that that's a, quite a serious commitment. Like you said, eight, eight months to a year um, to get through that program. So. It really takes a lot of hard and, work. Uh, and two and a half hours a week because you do right. an hour and a half of group and an hour mm -hmm. of individual therapy. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's very intense. It's a big commitment. But, you know, to be honest, when you reach rock bottom, and I'm sure Benita would agree, you're willing to try anything. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's like just, just have a try because in the end, it can't be worse if you've reached rock yeah. bottom. So. All right. It's working. Okay. So back back to Benita. So <clears throat> Benita, we I mean all of this sort of therapy, treatment, medication, whatever it is, is to try to control our condition so that we can be more normal in a way, whatever mean, whatever that means. Um, and I've had a number of conversations with people who have some sort of mental health condition, and we always have really interesting conversations about you know what is it worth doing to make yourself more normal if you somehow feel like you're losing an important part of yourself and i think you and i benita have had this discussion um yeah, so tell me tell me a little bit what does that mean what does it mean to be normal or how do you how do you manage with not like being the way you are as opposed to being somebody else's definition of normal i I, I I have discussed this with some friends. I mean, prefer not, not to use the spectrum normal and abnormal because it means anything that's not normal is abnormal. So is it better to use the term typical and non-typical? So maybe somebody like me and Solin will be not typical because we don't express those behavior that we have mood swings, whether it's uh, from seconds to days to uh, month. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think, uh, to, to use the inclusive language as well when uh, when you have pe people with mental health condition like I think now it's better we, we pe more people use mental health condition than mental illness it's not a, an illness is a condition that uh, that we are living with so I think just to try to use those language in our day-to-day -day life when when we are interacting people with mental health conditions or people living with mental health conditions yeah. will be helpful and, and for me um, 
uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I have one, uh, one person from the audience message me what was one good thing about bipolar. And I definitely would say the high hypomanic uh, phase. So not the manic phase, manic phase is not very good. It, it means you are like really crazy and like uh, really overspend and all that. But like sometime I would, there are times which, okay, not very good. I would uh, maybe skip, skip a medicine for one or two nights or I eat it very late or I have some alcohol because that will make me more creative. And when I'm in this slightly hypomanic phase, I am very productive. I can like write a lot. I can be very creative. And I think that's why there are many talented individuals uh, in, in the past, whether it's artists, musicians, um, they might be able to use this condition of them to their advantage. So e even though we might think mental health condition is always, it may not be always a bad thing. It can be always a good thing if we, if we actually manage it correctly and use it to our advantage. Totally agree. Thank you. And I think that typical and atypical is, is much better terminology than normal or not normal, because like none of us are normal. <laughs> so, but let's talk a little about the stigma. So uh, I think Benita, you mentioned that you, you're really uncomfortable about sharing your stories. So I think you said also it's kind of daunting still for you to talk about this stuff. But what, what's behind that? What sort of experiences have you had of, of stigma or, or what stigma do you just anticipate will, will come your way if people are aware of your condition? So I'll start with a statistics. Uh, in Hong Kong, uh, the statistics is one in uh, seven uh, in Hong Kong who experience a common mental disorder at a given time. And of those, uh, only three quarter, uh, three quarter will not seek help. And I think especially, I, I, and Solin, you can give the UK context. I think in Hong Kong, especially with a mostly Chinese society, people don't want to talk about mental health. Uh, people uh, think that mental health is, it's, it's like if you have cancer, it's okay. You can tell people about cancer, but you cannot tell people that uh, that you have a depression. And just from personally, um, uh, I, I grew up in a traditional Chinese family. And uh, I mean, my parents and my family were very supportive uh, when I was bipolar in the hospital for my recovery. But for the longest time, my mom think like telling other people about bipolar is a really bad thing. She think it will ruin my career. Uh, and and even for me myself, I uh, when I was work before Encompass, when I was like uh, employee you know, for other organization, I, I I think I have not told any of my boss. Uh, I, I may be uh, just uh, uh, informally discussed with some close colleagues because I'm also uh, afraid of uh, workplace stigma. If I tell people about my mental health condition, will will people doubt my job performance? So I was saying that I only come out. Uh, two years, uh, about two years ago, about mental health condition, and uh, when I first started Encompass, I, I I didn't tell people because I I feel like I don't have a strong record. I also feel that people will uh, doubt me if I have a mental health condition. So after two years, I feel like I'm in a better place. I feel like I have a track record, and with encouragement and other people, I feel like, and also I I feel Hong Kong is also changing. I feel in the last last few years uh, that people are more open to talk about mental health. And, uh, and I feel it's good that more people come out and tell other people what the lived experience and what they go through. And it will help our society to be more uh, acceptive, especially given Hong Kong now has a very high rate of depression and other mental health condition uh, because of COVID, because of social unrest or whatever that is. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I mean, I think Hong Kong is, is going in the right direction slowly. I think particularly your generation and younger, um, much more open about this. I think the older generation, like your, your mom, you described her hesitations, uh, harder for them. But Selene, I mean, you said you've lived in countries all around the world. I mean, do you see differences or is the stigma just as bad wherever you go? What's your experience? Oh, there are major differences, um, cultural differences in terms of stigma in terms of what is acceptable to talk about or not talk about. Um, and it's interesting because I got diagnosed um, just over a year ago. So very, you know, late uh, in terms of, um, I suppose, for, well, when, when typically people get diagnosed with borderline, which is usually in their teenagers, I'm not a teenager anymore. <laughs> People think I look like it, but no. <laughs> um, so, so that's um, that's one thing that means that I didn't know about my diagnosis when I lived in a lot of these different places. Of places. Oh. Can you hear me? 
it's yeah sorry happening? Solana I muted, I muted you rather than the person I was trying to admit <laughs> sorry about that <laughs> that's okay <laughs> um so so yes for example like I didn't know about my condition uh when I lived in China but looking back I realized that no one for like the two years I was there ever told me anything about mental health um I think it wasn't until I lived in Australia to be honest where um in Australia they have something called are you okay day which I love it's just about reminding everyone um you know to ask each other are you okay um, a couple of times, usually really meaning, you know, meaning the question and really is opening this conversation about mental health, which mental health, as we know, is a continuum. You can have a diagnosis of a mental health condition like the both of us and yet be mentally healthy and be living and thriving. Um, and then you can have no diagnosis and be really unwell and vice versa you can have a diagnosis and be unwell and you can have no diagnosis and 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 be very well so it is a continuum it's like picturing these four um, quadrants and you can shift and change throughout your life as well you know something might happen in life that might suddenly you know uh, i suppose trigger people to go through a depressive episode that may be even temporary right so there's so many nuances and I feel like that's not yet commonly understood across all cultures and like coming from a French culture and a French background I was taught very from a very young age that you have your professional life and you have your personal life and you never under any condition blur the line in between you never mix the two you don't become friends with your colleagues until you've left that workplace if ever um you know your your friends should not never hire them or work with them you know it's, it's very very strict and very strong especially like you said brian from the previous generation is changing massively and it's amazing to see but i think i still very much carried that and i think for me opening up about my diagnosis i've only been able to do that after going through the full circle of therapy after feeling already stronger in myself and yet it's still very daunting because of that workplace fear that benita described in terms of like is it going to make it more difficult to get promoted to get job opportunities to be heard in a meeting because if you're showing any kind of emotion, oh, that's because she has borderline, she can't handle it. You know, something like that, right? Um, if I could get a penny for every time I've heard, don't take it too personally, don't be too emotional, uh, don't be too much, da, 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 I would be so rich right now. And so I think it's like that fear of like, how are people maybe gonna, you're being vulnerable. You're opening a side of yourself that usually is behind closed doors and that culturally is behind closed doors. And so how are people going to react to that are they gonna give you a hug or are they gonna give you a stab in your you know you have no armor anymore so and that's the big question you can't control it but i think in the end for me and i'll end on this it comes down to like benita also said you know if we don't talk about it then nothing is ever going to change and so for me it's like i am totally totally willing to put myself out there and say hey like like I was diagnosed with, with borderline um, to hopefully help other people because it's helped me to read other stories of other people who have recovered or sorry, from, in my opinion, you never fully recover, who are in recovery, in permanent recovery and who are living amazing lives. And it's helped me so much. And I'm like, we need more of that. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's worth the risk. We do. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. I mean, I think your, your courage, uh, both of you and uh, the articulate way you're able to explain all of these complex experiences to simple people like me is, is just so inspiring. Um, and I think the other thing, I guess, is that it, it really is helpful uh, to open up and share because you find actually there are other people out there, in fact, who have borderline or even have bipolar and have same maybe or different experience as you described, um, but at least you have something in common. And, uh, Knowing that you're not alone, I think is is really helpful. I've certainly found that and experienced that through my own experience and through the support groups that we run. So, so thank you both so much. It's been absolutely wonderful hearing from you. I'm going to stop the recording and then we can open it up to the floor. <laughs>